Hello everyone and welcome back to the Pilot Time channel. My name is Red and today we are back with another episode of Pilot Time Reads. With this episode starts the reading of a new book, so a bit of a new season if you will uh, in this series. I guess each each season would be a different book. Not really sure how to how how to structure it in like a regular or like a traditional sense but regardless there we're back with another book and i have uh, since the last episode i've been able to finally choose what book i'm going to read and i'm going to be reading techno feudalism what killed capitalism by yanis varoufakis um i chose to read this book specifically for this next uh se season um or this next uh series because uh, I've been trying to learn a lot about just generally the, the inner workings of uh, the economy and everything and how it relates to, you know, the, the, the relations that we, we have in, in society and just generally understand the world as a, as a whole. And I think that, you know, this book is going to further allow me to expand that that knowledge and the other book that was that I was uh, re considering reading is a bit more of a of a sci-fi story. I mean, that's what it is. And I was more I w the reason I wanted to read that book is more out of my curiosity of wanting to read a sci-fi story with political commentary regarding socialism rather than um, becoming more knowledgeable on a on topic right so i chose to go with this one and then go with the other book on another uh occasion so before i do anything else of course i have to say that if you enjoy this content you can support us over on patreon if you can support us through patreon you can always check out our website and see in other ways in what other ways you can support us mostly in our collaboration tab where you can learn uh, how you can help us out make better content and grow uh, as a company and you know trying to grow our uh our little movement we got going on here um, of course, you can also join our Discord server, you can join our community, and if you do so and support us on Fair Patreon, you get access to some special perks on our Discord server, like being able to submit questions to our podcast Q&A, where, you know, each week on our podcast, we try to answer the questions of our community. And of course, also, don't forget to check out our social media platforms where we keep everybody updated on the newest content. Of course, lately, we haven't been super active because we have just not had much of a reason to do so. But as people, you know, start following us more, of course, we'll be more active and trying to be more interactive uh, and all that. Um, so I'm going to just kind of read the synopsis or just like the back cover of the book to just kind of get an understanding of what this book is and of course to do so to so that you can choose if you want to listen to the rest of the episode or not so notice no one noticed when capitalism was replaced perhaps we were too distracted by the pandemic or the endless financial crisis or the rise of tech talk but under cover of them all a new and a more exploitive system has been taking hold Insane sums of money that were supposed to refloat our economies went to a big t went to big tech instead. Having privatized the internet, big tech has been able to replace capitalism's twin pillars, markets and profits, with its platforms and rents. With every click and scroll, we labor like we labor like serfs to increase this power its power. Welcome to techno feudalism the new power that is reshaping our lives and the world and the greatest current uh, threat to social democracy. Drawing on stories from Greek myth and pop culture from Homer to Mad Men, best-selling economist Yanis Varoufakis explains the revolution, this revolutionary transformation, how it enslaves our minds, how it rewrites the rules of global power, and ultimately what it will take to overthrow it. So there you go. <laughs> now I'm going to get into the actual book and read the different, like the little, um, the different chapters we have for this book. I'm going to have a very similar kind of logic to the last book where I'm going to try to read uh, basically a chapter per episode. 
um, if I see that a chapter is very short, I will read more than a chapter in an episode, but it seems like from just kind of quickly glancing um, at the, the contents of the book that this might be, I don't know, like 10, eight, nine episodes. So it's going to be a long series, this one, compared to the Communist Manifesto, but the Communist Manifesto is a relatively small book anyways, and this book is bigger in every dimension literally like it's thicker wider taller <laughs> it's big in every sense compared to the communist manifesto so we start with a preface and before going to the first um into the first chapter so some years ago i decided to write a brief history of capitalism to temper the tasks enormity and force myself to focus on what capitalism boils down to, I decided to pretend I was narrating capitalism story to my 12-year-old daughter. It's my 12-year-old daughter, sorry. Uh, so without seeking Xenia's permission, I'm guessing that's Yanis' uh, daughter, something she will never let me forget, I began writing the book in, in the form of a long letter to her, taking care to use no jargon, not even the word capitalism, I kept reminding myself that whether or not my narrative made sense to a younger, to the youngster was a lit litmus test of my own grasp of cap capitalism's essence. The result was a slim volume entitled Talking to My Daughter, A Brief History of Capitalism. It took as its starting point an apparently simple question of hers. Why is there so much inequality? Even before it was published in 2017, it was feeling an, I was feeling uneasy. Between finishing the manuscript and holding the, publishing, the published book in my hand, I felt as if it were the 1840s and I was about to publish a book on feudalism. Or even worse, like waiting for a book on Soviet central planning to see the light of day in late 1889. Blatantly, that is. In the year after it was published, the first in Greek, later in English, my weird hypothesis that capitalism was on the way out and not merely undergoing one of its many impressive metamorphoses gathered strength. During the, the pandemic, during the pandemic, it became a, a conviction, which became an, arg an urge to explain my thinking in a book if... Uh, for not for no other reason than to give friends uh, and foes outrage, uh, outraged by my theories a chance to disparage it properly having pursued it in full. So what is by synopsis? Hold up, I gotta change my book holding position. Got a little uncomfortable there. Uh, so what is my synop a synopsis? It is that capitalism is now dead. In the, sen in the sense that its dynamics no longer govern our economies. It, uh, in that role, it has been replaced by something fundamentally different, which I call techno-feudalism. At the heart of my thesis is an irony that may sound confusing at first, but which I hope to make sense per... per to, uh, them, uh, what? I lost myself, sorry. At the heart of the th my thesis is an irony that may sound confusing at first, but which I hope to show makes perfect sense. The thing that has killed capitalism is capital itself. Not capital as we know it since the dawn of the industrial area, er, area, era, but a new form of capital, a mutation of it that has arisen in the last two decades. So much more powerful than its predecessor that, uh, that like a stupid overzealous virus, it has killed off its host. What folk caused this to happen? Two main developments, the, privatiz the privatization of the internet by America and Chinese big tech, and the manner in which Western governments and central banks responded to the 2008 great financial crisis. This is not a book about what technology will do to us. It is not about AI chatbots that will take over our jobs, autonomous robots that will threaten our lives, or Mark Zuckerberg's ill-conceived metaverse. Uh, <laughs> Nice. Um, no, this book is about what has already been done to capitalism, and therefore to us, by the screen-based cloud-linked devices we all use, our boring laptop and our smartphones, in conjunction with the way central banks and governments have been attacking since acting, sorry, since 2008. 
the historic mutation of capital and uh, that I am highlighting has already happened, but caught up in our pre pressing dramas from debt worries and pandemic to wars and climate emergency, we have barely noticed. It is high time we paid attention. If we do pay attention, it is not hard to see that, cap that capital's mutation into what I call cloud capital has demolished capitals, capitalism's two pillars, markets and profits. Of course, markets and profits remain uh, uh, ubiquitous. Indeed, markets and profits were ubiquitous under feudalism too. They just aren't running the show anymore. What has happened over the, two, the last two decades in that profit and markets have been evicted from the epicenter of econ economic and social systems, system pushed out its margins and replaced, uh, replaced. with what? Markets and medium of capitalism have been replaced by digital tr trend trading platforms, which look like, but are not markets, and are better understood as fiefdoms. And profit, the engine of rent. What? Sorry, no, what? I skipped the line. And profit, the engine of capitalism, that makes more sense, has been replaced with its feudal pre predecessor, rent. Specifically, it is a form of rent that must be paid for access to those, to those platforms and to the cloud more broadly. I call it cloud rent. As a result, real power today resides not with the owners of traditional capital, such as machinery, buildings, railway, and phone networks, industrial robots. They continue to extract profits from workers, from wage labor, but they are not in charge as they once were. As we shall see, they have become vassals in relation to a new class of feudal overlord, the owner of cloud capital. As for the rest of us, we have returned to our former status as serfs, distributing to the wealth and power of the new ruling class with our un unpaid labor, in addition to the wage labor we uh, perform when we get the chance. Does all this matter to the, to the way we live and experience our lives? It certainly does. As I'll show in chapter 5, 6, and 7, recognizing that our world has become techno-feudal helps us dissolve, uh, dissolve? Yeah. puzzles great and small. From the elusive green energy revolution and green Elon Musk's decision to buy Twitter to new cloud war, uh, the new cloud war, Oh, sorry, the new Cold War between the US and China and how the war in Ukraine is threatening the dollars, uh, the dollars right from the deaths of the liberal individual and the impossibility of social democracy to the false promise of crypto and burning question of who may recover our autonomy, perhaps our freedom too. By late 2021, armed with these convictions and egged, and egged, oh yeah, egged, on by a pandemic that strengthened uh, them, the die had become, had been cast. The die had been cast. I'm really bad at reading. I'm so sorry. Uh, I would sit down and write a brief introduction to techno feudalism, the far, far uglier social reality that has superseded capitalism. One question remained whom to address it to. Without much thought, I decided to address it to the person who had introduced me to capitalism at a ridiculously young age, and who, like his granddaughter, once asked me apparently simple questions that shaped almost every page of this book, my father. For the impatient reader, a word of warning. My description of techno-feudalism does not come until chapter 3, and for my description to make sense, I, would, I need first to recount capitalism's astonishing metamorphosis over the preceding decades. This is chapter 2. The beginning of the book, meanwhile, is not about techno-feudalism at all. Chapter 1 tells the story of how my father, with the help of some mental fragments and his 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 uh, i used to remember how to say this word or this name his hesoids hesoids uh i'm sure that in the next episode i'll be able to read it uh <laughs> poetry introduced my six-year-old self to technology uh checkered relationship with humanity and ultimately to capitalism's essence it presents the guiding principles on which all 
of the thinking that follows is based. And it concludes with the seemingly simple question Father put put me in uh, put to me in 1993. The rest of the book takes the, fir- the form of a letter addressed to him. It is my attempt to answer his killer question. All right. That's that's fair. Uh, didn't expect that, but I guess we're going on a little bit of a... Uh, uh, I don't know. I was going to say history lesson, but I don't know if it's really a history lesson. Yeah. Okay, let's, let's do this. So chapter one, Hesiod's Lament. And yes, I did Google it real quickly, how to say it. Hesiod's. Hesiod and Hesiod's Lament. Okay, there you go. I got it. <laughs> My father has the only was the only lefty I know who failed to understand why calling Maggie uh, Thatcher the Iron Lady was somehow derogatory. <laughs> and I must have been the only child raised to believe that gold was Iron's proper cousin. My catechism in Iron's magical qualities began in the, the winter of 1966, which I recall as the bitter, bitterly cold one. In their haste to leave behind the cramped, rented apartment where we were staying while our home in Palio Fulirio or Palio? I'm not, I'm, this is, I'm guessing this is a Greek name, so I'm not really sure how to read it, but it's Palio Palero or Feliro. I'm not sure if the PH is going to, is read as an F. Uh, so yeah, uh, our home in this place, a coastal uh, Athen- Athenian suburb has been re was being rebuilt my parents moved us back into the non-quiet completed house in the midst of winter before any central heating had been installed thankfully dad had insisted that our new living room feature uh feature a decent red brick fireplace it was there in front of its warm glow that over the course of several winter nights he introduced me one at a time to his friends, as he called them. All right. Uh, I could make a voices joke right now. Anyways, um, father's friends. His friends arrived in a large gray sack that he bought home one evening from the factory. The steel plant in Eleusis. Eleusis? God, I'm really bad at reading names. Sorry. Um, where he would work as a chemical engineer for six decades. They were mightily unimpressive. Some looked like shapeless rocks, lumps of ore, as I was to learn later. Other were equally uh, equally uninspiring rods and metal plates of various shapes. If I weren't for the loving manner in which I laid out each one of them on a folded white hand embroidered tablecloth in front of the fireplace, I would have never have thought of them as special. Ten was the first friend he introduced me to. After giving me a piece to hold to feel its softness, he placed it in an iron bowl, which he had rested on the roaring fire. As the tin began to melt and the metallic liquid filled up the bowl, Dad's, Dad's, pardon me, Dad's eyes lit up. All that is solid melts into liquid, and then, given enough the heat, turns into steam, even metals. Once he has confident, I had appreciated the great transition from solid to liquid state. Together, we pour the liquid tin into a mold, immersed in in it, immersed it in water to cool it down, and then broke the mold open so that I could once again take the tin in my hands to ascertain. Uh, that our friend had, had was back to normal, that it had been returned to its initial state. The following night, we experienced, we experimented, sorry, with another friend, a long-ish rod made of bronze. This time, there was no great transition, as bronze's melting temperature is at least five times that of tin. Still, the rod began to glow a brilliant orange, orangey gray, and that showed me how to give whatever shape I wanted to it, its hot tip with the help of a small steel hammer. Once I had enough, we uh, immersed it in cold water also to return it and cool and unchanged to its original malleable state. On the third night, Dad seemed more excited that, than ever. He was about to introduce me to his best friend, Iron. <laughs> 
To add attention to the moment, he removed his gold wedding ring from his finger and showed, me, uh, showed it to me. See how gold gleams? He said. Humans have or, or always fallen for, its, for this metal because of its looks. What if they don't realize is that it is just that, flashy, not special. If I wanted, he would be happy to demonstrate when gold is heated up and immersed in water to cool it down again, it returns like tin and bronze to its prior, prior, prior state. Sorry, Glad that I did not hesitate on a demonstration, he moved on to his favorite part. Holding up a piece of iron ore and glazing gla gazing, sorry, what glazing, Jesus, and gazing at the in, in, insipid a lump like Hamlet compelling Yorick's skull that pronou uh, pro pronounced. Now, if you want a truly magical substance, this is this is it. Iron, the wizard of metal uh, material, sorry. And then he proceeded to back up his claim by sub subjecting an iron rod to the same torture he had inflicted on the bronze rod the previous night. <laughs> but with a couple of crucial differences. It's such a weird <laughs> description of these events, but it's really funny. Before heating up the iron, I was given a chance to hammer at its tip to ascertain that it was soft and almost as malleable as bronze. Once in the fireplace, a small bellows helped us fan the uh wait a small bull bellows yeah sorry a small bellows helped us fan the flames until the iron's glow had turned the dimly lit living room scarlet we took the rod out of the fireplace and with the little hammer shaped it into this into something that in my boyish eyes looked like a sword throwing it into color cold water made the iron hiss in as if in triumph poor polyphys well sorry poor polyphys fuck i am really bad at reading complex names poor polyphemus there you go i got it father remarked mysteriously heat it up again he said put the rod back into the fire this time immersed it in water before it glows Excited by the hissing iron, I was glad that we repeated the quenching process as me me metallurgists call it three or four times. Before I, was, I got a chance properly to admire my new sword, that announced that the moment of truth had arrived. Pick it up, the hammer, and pick up the hammer and deliver an almighty strike on the sword's tip, he instructed. But I, won't, I don't want to ruin it, I protested. Go on, do it. You'll see. Don't sp spare your strength. I didn't. The hammer struck the sword's tip and bounced right back. I struck it again and again. It made no difference. My sword, my, my sword was impre impervious to the blows. Hardness. Or hard, what? No, the blows. Hardened. Father could not contain himself. What had... I had witnessed, he explained, was not a mere great transformation, as with tin that melted, but a great transformation. True, copper had Phyllis facilitated, sorry, did I skip a word? I'm confused. No, that's right, okay, sorry. Um, oh boy. Uh, tr true, copper had Phyllis facilitated our deliverance from prehistory, prehistory, its ability to uh, to alloy with our arsenic and tend to make the harden, harder metal bronze gave the Mesopotamians, the Egyptians, and the Archaeans new technologies, including new plows, axes, and irrigation, allowed them ultimately to produce the large agricultural surplus that founded the construction of splendid temples and murderous armies. But for history to celebrate sufficiently to bring to oh boy, hold up, gotta change the book again. Um, but for history to accelerate sufficiently to bring about what we now call civilization, humanity needed something much harder, still than uh, still than bronze. It needed its plows, its hammers, and its metal and its metal structures to have the hardness of sword's tips. 
It needed to learn the trick I had seen in our living room, how to transform soft iron into hardened steel by baptizing it with cold water. Bronze Age co communities that did not learn how to baptize iron perished, he insisted. The sword of their ironclad enemies sliced through their bronze shields. Their plows failed to cultivate then uh, the less fertile soils. The metal braces holding together their dams and temples were too weak to to fulfill the ambitious the ambitions of forward-thinking architects. In contrast, communities that mustered the, tec the technique, uh, the art of s stealing iron, thriving uh, thrived in the fields, on the battlefield, at sea, in commerce, in the arts. Iron's magic underpinned the new role of uh, technology as the driving force that led to civilization and its th discontents. Lest I doubt the cultural permanence of our little experiment and the arrival of the Iron Age, Father explained his earlier reference to poor Polyphobus. Damn, I'm bad at reading that name. The one-eyed giant who, according to Homer, inspired, uh, imprisoned, uh, Od 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 Odysseus, sorry, um, and his men in a cave, talking, taking his time to devour them one by one. To set them and himself free, Odysseus waited for Polyphemus to fall into a drunken stupmore heated up a wooden stake in the cave's open fire and aimed and aided by his comrades sh shoved it into uh polyphemus's soul eye all right remember the sound of the hissing iron dad asked well homer homer must have been equally impressed by it judging by the verse in the uh odysseys that capture the cruel moment I'm guessing this is a Part of that book um and as when a smith dips a great axe or an aids in cold water admit loud hissing to temper it for their uh, for their from comes the strength of iron even so did his eye hiss around the stake of wood uh olive wood sorry odysseus and his contemporary contemporaries proceeded uh the iron age sorry i had a bit of a brain fart uh odysseus and his contemporaries preceded the iron age uh and could not have been have known how iron's hissing herald a molecular hardening of historic s significance but homer who lived a couple of centuries after the trojan war was a child of the iron age and thus came of age in the midst uh, amidst of technological and social revolution that still had uh, wrote. In, ca in case I thought Homer was an outlier, that pointed to the lasting influence of iron's magic by quoting Sophil Sophocles? Sophocles, who for centuries later described a soul as a hardened, like immersed, uh, uh, immersed iron. He, prehistory uh, gave its place to history, Father says. Father said, when bronze displaced stone, tools, and weapons. Once bronze became widespread after 4000 BC, powerful civilizations emerged in Mesopotamia, Egypt, China, India, Crete, Crete, our, this name is familiar, Mycenae, and elsewhere. But still, history was counted in the millennia, to be counted in the centuries. We had to discover the magic of iron. Once the Iron Age got going around the 9th, 9th century BC, three different and remarkable eras emerged in quick succession, with no more than seven centuries in total. The geom ge geometric period, the classical era, and the Hellenistic uh, civilization. From the glacial speeds of the Bronze Age, humanity had been propelled to the breathless developments of the Iron Age. But for a long time, iron and steel remained too difficult to produce, too expensive. 
even after the Industrial Revolution, the first steamships were mostly wooden, with steel providing only the essential components, boiler, chimney, joints. Enter, other one, enter another one of father's great heroes, Henry Bessemer, who, sorry, pardon me, who invented a technique for producing large quantities of steel cheaply by blowing air through molten pig, pig? iron. What is pig iron? I don't know what pig iron is, uh, to molten pig iron to burn off uh, impurities. It was then, according to dad, that history accelerated the speeds uh, with which we are familiar today. Coupled with the taming of electromagnetism, which we owe uh, the other another Victorian, James Maxwell, Bessemer's technique gave us the second industrial revolution. The period of rapid technological innovation from 1870 onwards, as distinct from the arrival of the factories earlier that century in the first industrial revolution, its wonders and horrors wrapped tightly together. Looking back to those few winters nights in 1966, it is now clear to me that I was being introduced in historical materialism. The method of understanding history as a con constant feedback loop between uh, on the one hand, the way humans transform matter, and on the other hand, the, matter, the manner in which humans think and social relations are transformed in, in return. Thanks to Lee Father's historical materialism was nuanced. His enthusiasm of technology tempered by judicious doses of angst about humanity, humanity's infinite ca capacity to mess, up thing, to mess things up, to turn miraculous technology into living hell. That's, that's a wise man he was. Iron, like all revolutionary technologies, had sped up history. But in which direction? For what purpose? With what effect on us? As that explained from the very start of the Iron Age, there were those who foresaw its tragic consequences. Um, Hesoid was composing poetry uh, uh, at around the same time as Homer. His works... Uh, works and days had a uh, salutary cooling influence on dad's enthusiasm from iron and more generally technology. I wish I had not, uh, what I wish I had not have to live among the people of the fifth age, the iron age, but either had died earlier or had been or been born later. For now, truly, is a generation of iron who never rest from labor and sorrow by day or from perishing by night. But notwithstanding the good mingled with their evils, this generation will know no favor for those who keep their oath or for the just or for the good. Strength, strength shall be right. The wicked will hurt the worthy. Better sorrows will be left for us mortals, and there will be no one to help against evil. Again, uh, according to Hesoid, iron hardened not only our uh, plow, uh, plows, yes, plow, sorry, that word messes me up every time, um, our plows, but also our souls. Other Under its influence, our spirit was hammered and forged into fire, our brand new desires quenched like the hissing metal in the smith's cauldron. Virtues were tested and values destroyed, just as our bounty bur uh, burgoy bur burgeons, sorry, our, uh, as our bounty uh, burgeoned and our states expanded. Strength began new joys, but weariness and in injustices too. Zeus would have no choice. Hesoid foretold, but to one day destroy a humanity incapable of restraining its own technolo technological induced power. My father wanted to dis disagree with Hesoid. He wanted to believe that we humans could become masters of our own technology rather than enslave ourselves and one another with it. When Prometheus uh, stole fire, uh, symbolizing the white heat of technology from Zeus on humanity's behalf, behalf, he did so in the hope that he would uh, enlighten up our lives without 
an inanimate, uh, without burning down the earth. But my father wanted to believe we could make Prometheus proud. And in innate optimism was only one reason that remained hopeful that humanity would not waste the magical powers we had introduced me to in front of our fireplace fire pit in front of our fireplace there you go another was his encounter with the nature of light one time as i was removing an iron rod from the fire that asked can you guess what leaves uh, the heated up metal to reach your eyes so that you could see it, its red glow. I had no idea. Happily, I was not alone. For centuries, light had divided the best minds we had, that he said. Some like Aristotle and James Maxwell thought of light as some kind of disturbance in the ether, a wave that spread out were outwards from the in, initial source like sound does. Others such as Dem Dem Democritus and Isaac Newton pointed out that unlike sound, light cannot bend round corners, something waves do by their very nature, and thus it must be made of tiny things or particles traveling in a straight line before... I just spit on the book, God damn it. Um, traveling in a straight line before hitting our eyes, retina, who was right. My father's life changed, or so he said, he told me, when he read Albert Einstein's answer. They were all right. Light is at once a stream of particles and a series of waves. But how could that be? Particles differ fundamentally from waves. They are located at only one point at any particular moment in time. They have momentum, and they move all only in a straight line, unless and until something gets in their way waves by contrast are uh, uh oscillations of a medium which is what allows them to turn cor corners and transport energy in many different directions at once to prove uh, as einstein had done that light was both particles and waves was to admit that something can be utterly contradictory uh, that can that something can be two utterly contradictory things at once. For that, a, uh, the dual nature of light was a gateway to recognizing the uh, essential dualism underlying all of nature and the all in society. If light could be two very different things at once, he wondered in a letter he wrote as a young man to his mother, if matter is energy and energy is matter, as Einstein had also discovered, why must we cast life either in black and white terms, or even worse, in shades of gray? By the time I was 12 or 13, it was clear to me from our ongoing conversations that that love, that lad's, dad's love for iron's magic, technology, and for Einstein's, Einstein's physics, the contradictory duality of all things had something to do with his left-wing politics for which he had spent several years in prison camps. My hunch was confirmed when it came across the text. Uh, this is going to, okay, I'm not going to say what I was going to say. Never mind. My hunch was confirmed when it came across the text of speech delivered by the same person who had first formulated the, the notion of historical materialism, Karl Marx. It was if that had been speaking the words. God, I, I, I need to, I'm only going to comment on this specific part at the end of the episode, but I'm, I'm kind of boiling right now for a very funny reason. In our days, everything seems pregnant with its con contrary machinery gifted with the wonderful power of shortening and, uh, and fructifying human labor. We behold starving and overworking it. Newfangled sources of wealth by some strange weird spell are turned into sources of want. The victories of art seem bought by the loss of character. The power to shorten human labor and make it fruitful resulted from the great transformations of matter father had been so keen to demonstrate for my benefit. Iron turning to steel on a fireplace, heat turning to kinetic energy in James Watt's miraculous fire engine, the minor miracles occurring within the telegraphs, magnets, and cables. But ever since Hesoid's fifth age, it was a power pregnant uh, with its opposite as well. 
the power to starve and to overwork, to turn a source of wealth into a source of want. The link between father's twin devotions to furnaces, metallurgy, and metallur metallur metallurgy, metallurgy, I'm not sure how to pronounce that word. I wonder what it means, but I don't know how to pronounce that word. And technology in general, on the one hand, had to do with his politics. On the other, became impossible to miss when I first read the Communist Manifesto. In partic particular, the line, all that is solid melts into air. All that is holy is profaned, and man is at all compelled to face with sober sense his real conditions of life and his relations with his, with his kind. It brought, brought back memory of his childlike enthusiasm at his sight of melting metal in front of our fireplace, or far more spectacularly, at the steel plant whose quality control department he directed and were and where temperatures were high enough for iron literally to melt into air. But unlike Hesoid, uh, Hesioid, I think I've been saying that wrong, Hesioid are indeed the more, more moralists of our own era that did not feel he had to take sides. To be either a technophobe or t a techno th enthusiast, a tech enthusiast, if light can have two contradictory natures, and if all of nature rests on a binary opposite, then hardened iron, steam engines, and networked computers could also be simultaneously potentially li uh, liberators and enslavers. And so it, it's, it is up to us collectively to determine which of the two it will be. That's where politics comes in. Leftists usually become radical, like, radicalized in reaction to the vile injustices and mind-numbing inequality capitalism generates. Not so in my case. Sure, growing up in the midst of a fascist dictatorship played its roles, but my leftism had far more esoteric origins, a sensitivity given to me by my father to the duality of things. Well, before I read a word that marks well before I read a word that Marx or any other economist had written, I thought I could discern several dualities buried deep in the foundations of our society. My first inkling, 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 yes, of such a duality hit me one evening when mom complained to dad that I, sorry, that the fertilizer factory where she worked, uh, worked as a chemist she got paid for her time, but never for her enthusiasm. My wage is crap because my time is cheap, she said. My passion to get the right results uh, the bosses get for free. Soon after, she resigned and got herself a job as a biochemist at a public hospital. A few months into the new job, she told us happily, at least at the hospital, I love that my efforts benefit patients, even if I am as invisible to them as I used to be to the factory owners. Those words stuck with me. Mom had inadvertently introduced me to the duality of wage labor, the wage she was paid for her time and formal skills, her certificates, degrees, reflected the ex exchange uh, value of the hours she spent at work. But that's not what injected, uh, injected true value into whatever was being manufactured in our workplace. That was added to what was produced at the factory of, uh, or the hospital through her efforts, enthusiasm, application, even flair. None of which were uh, re remu <laughs> remunerated. It, it's like going to a, watch a movie at the cinema. The ticket, the ticket price you pay reflects the movie's exchange value, but that is quite separate from the pressure it gives you, which you, we might call the experimental value. In the same way, labor is split between commodity labor, mom's time bought by her wage, and experimental value, the efforts, the passion, and flair she put into her work. When in time I did come to read Marx, I vividly recall how excited I was to discover that, thanks to my father's fireside lesson and my mom's explanation, I had stumbled upon one of the great, great economists' central principles. In the world we, can, we take for granted today, labor seems like any other commodity. 
Desperate to make a, li a living, people promote their skills like vendors advertising their wage, their wares. Sorry, they accept a market determined price, the wage for their labor, which reflects its exchange value, i.e., what is uh, other compar uh, worth compared to other exchangeable commodities. This is commodity labor. However, as we have seen, unlike soap powder, potatoes, or iPhones, which are nothing but commodities, labor is something else besides. To illustrate labor's second nature, the experimental labor that my mom first alerted me to, consider, consider the brilliant idea conjured by a group of brainstorming architects employed by a multinational construction firm. Or the positive vibe a, a vibes a waiter emits on the restaurant floor, or a teacher's tear of joy when a challenged pupil solves a difficult math problem. None of these can ever truly be commodified. Why? Because no monetary reward can pr can pr uh, prompt sorry can prompt a moment of true inspiration. No genuine smell can be bought. No authentic tear can be shed for a price. In fact, any attempt to do so would immediately negate them. Indeed, bosses who try to qual qu uh, quantify, price, or commodify experimental labor, uh, ex experimental labor, yes, will sound like the fool who yell at you, be spontaneous. <laughs> what I call experimental labor, the part which n can never be sold, Marx called simply labor. And what I have labeled commodity labor, Marx defined as laboring power. But the idea is the same. What the working man sells is not directly his labor, but his laboring power, the temporary disposal of which he makes over the capitalist. Imagine my joy when I discovered that, based on labor's two natures, Marx had erected a whole theory of capitalism. For herein lies capitalism's secret, the uncommodifiable sweat, effort, inspiration, goodwill, care and tears of employees are what breathe exchange value into the commodities that employers then fog to eager customers. This is actually what makes the building or restaurant or school desirable. One may protest that there is many a factory populated by uninspired, joyless robotic workers producing tin cans or gadgets worth more than the cost of paying the workers. True, but this happens only because employers cannot buy the effort put in by the unskilled manual laborers. They can only buy their time, during which the pressure, pressurize, sorry, to pressurize them in a variety of ways to work hard and to sweat. The point here is that this blue collar sweat, exactly like the wage architects, architects flair, can never be directly bought or sold. This is indeed the secret power of employers. To extract any surplus, either from highly skilled or from uninspired repetitive robotic work, they must pay for their workers' time, commodity labor, but cannot actually buy their sweat, sweat or flair, experimental um, labor. You might think it's it extremely frustrating to employers that they cannot buy the architect's eureka moment, the waiter's spontaneous smile, the teacher's tear directly, without without it, it which their employees' work produced no value. On the contrary, employers resemble the customer who bought a jacket for a thousand dollars only to find two thousand dollars sewn in its lining. Indeed, if they don't, they go bust. When I first encountered this revel revelatory explanation of capitalism's secret, I found it captivating to think that capitalists owe their profits to an inability to the impossibility of buying experimental labor directly. And yet, what a boon to suffer from such an inca incapacity. Sorry. For it is ultimately they who pocket the difference between the exchange value they pay employees in exchange for their commodity labor, wages, and the exchange value of the commodities created thanks to their experimental labor. In other words, labor's dual nature is what gives rise to profit. It is not just labor that has a dual nature. The dominant propaganda today, and while I was growing up, 
is that profit is the price or reward of a thing called capital and that people who have capital such as tools raw materials money anything that can be used to produce sell saleable goods make a profit by developing it in the same way a worker makes a wage by developing her labor but the conclusion that profit results from labor's contradictory twin nature led me to reject this notion too Again, even before I had read Marx, and thanks to paying attention to mom and dad, the more I thought of capital, the more convinced I became that like light and labor, it too featured two natures. One is commodity capital, uh, example, a fishing rod, a tractor, a company server, or any good that is produced to be used in production of another commodity. Capital's second nature, however, is nothing like a commodity. Suppose I discover that I possess tools you need in order to produce the stuff for your family's survival, such as a afford aforementioned fishing rod tractor server. Suddenly I have acquired the power to make you do things, for example, to work for me in exchange for the use of my tools. Capital, in short, is both a thing, commodity capital, and a forge, power capital, just as labor is split between commodity labor and experimental labor. By the time I began reading Marx, I could not help but f filter the, his words through the lens given to, my, to, to me by my mom's work, Dysphoria, and by my dad's inspiration from the great 20th century physicists. Delighted as I was by the dual dualities I was seeing, deep down I wondered what Einstein would have made of my wild ex <laughs> extrapolations from his theory of light or rather from the puny grasp of it to the essence of capitalism. Had my father inadvertently misrepresented Einstein, prompting my imagination to run away at the tangent thanks to a flimsy and perhaps false metaphor. Many years later, I, ch I chased upon this sentence written by Einstein himself. It is important to understand that even in theory, the payment of the worker is not determined by the value of his product. It appeared in an article entitled Why Socialism, published in May 1949. Reading it, I, bre <laughs> I breathe a sigh of relief. No, I had not only been taking liberties with Einstein's insights, after all, he too believed that capitalism's essence was the splitting of labor into two incursious natures. Uncle Albert, as father used to refer to Einstein on occasion, was not finished with my education regarding capitalism. Having opened my eye to the dual nature of both labor and capital, he guided me to the dual nature of money through an even more uh, circuitous path involving a certain John Maynard Keynes. In 1905, the 26 year old Einstein found the guts to tell a deeply skeptical world that light was a continuous field of waves made up of particle like things, and moreover, the energy and matter were essentially one thing, linked by his uh, by history, sorry, most famous equation E equals mc squared, i.e., a body of energy. Uh, content is equal to its mass times the second by the sorry by the times the speed of light multiplied by itself. A decade later, Einstein extended his special theory of relativity uh, to el elucidate one of his great greatest puzzles: gravity. The general the general theory of rel rev uh, relativity sorry <laughs> that resulted was not for the fainted heart to grasp it we first had to embrace a mindset that rejected that our senses told us. If you want to understand gravity, Einstein explained, you need to stop thinking of space as a box that the universe comes in. Matter and energy operating as one mold the contours of space and shape the flow of time. The only way to wrap your mind around space and time or matter and energy is to think of them as partners locked in the most intimate, insoluble em embrace. Gravity is what we feel as we traverse the short, shortest path through this fourth, this four dimensional space time. 
that our brains find it hard to grasp the reality unveiled by Einstein's general, general theory of relativity is inspiring. We evolve on the surface of a planet that is minuscule in comparison to the universe out there. In our limited realm, we can get by quite nicely with our senses, helpfully illusions. For instance, the belief that the grass is green, straight lines exist, or that time is a constant and independent of our no motion. This belief are false and yet helpful to the extent that they enable our architects to design safe buildings or the watches to coordinate our meanings uh, at pre-agreed points in time. When playing pool as the cue ball strikes a colored ball, we have become convinced of our clear causal effect. But were we to rely on these illusions to travel beyond our planet to the um, macros the macrocosm out there, we would be literally lost in space. Equally, when we peer deep into the world of the subatomic particles that compromise our body, that, that comprise our body, sorry, and, or the chair we are sitting on, oh my God, they know I'm sitting on a chair. Even the link between cause and effect vanishes. What does any of this have to do with money? The title of the most famous economist book of the 20th century is The General Theory of Employment, Interest, and Money. Published in 1936, it was written by John Maynard Keynes. Yeah, that's the name. In order to explain why capitalism was failing to recover from the general, the Great Depression and the illusions of Einstein's great theory of uh, theory was intentional. Keynes, who had met Einstein and knew of his work, chose it so as to herald a complete break from conventional economics, a break as clean as divisive as that of Einstein's form uh, from classical physics. Of his fellow economists who ins insisted that money ought to be understood as another commodity, Keynes once said that they resemble Euclidean geomet geomet ge who? geometers, there you go, I got it, um, in a non-Euclidean world. Again, confirming in a uncertain terms, Einstein's influence. Conventional economic thinking about money was damaging humanity. Keynes thought economists resembled spacecraft engineers disastrously relying on Euclid, Euclid not Einstein. They were using illusions which, while helpful in the uh, microcosm of a single market, example the market of potatoes, where a fall in the price can suddenly be relied upon the boost of sales, were catastrophic when applied to the economy at large, the macro economy, where a fall in the price of money, the interest rate, may never boost the money's flow in the form of investment and employment, in the same way that Einstein had in, had ended our illusion that time stands outside and apart from space. Keynes wanted to stop us thinking uh, of money as a thing, as simply another commodity that stands outside of apart from our other activities in markets and workplaces. Today, we are bombarded with the phantasmagoria of uh, idiocies about money. Sorry. Clueless politicians invoke penny-pinching metaphors of just uh, to justify self-defeating uh, austerity. Central bankers, facing both inflation and deflation, resemble the proverbial ass, <laughs> okay, both thirsty and hungry, who collapse, collapses because it can't decide whether to drink or to f eat first. Crypto enthusiasts invite us to think of the world by embracing the ultimate money commodity from Bitcoin and its various offspring. Big tech is c creating its own digital money with which to lure us deeper into it, its poison web of platforms. I think of no better defense in the face of um, of this orchestrated uh, functions, Keynes's, Einstein's de derived advice. Stop thinking about money as something desperate from what we, for something separate from what we do to each other with each other at work during play in every nook and cranny of our social 
universe. Yes, money is a thing, a commodity like any other, but it is also something much bigger than that. It is above all else a reflection of our relation to another and to our technologies, i.e. the means and the ways in which we transform matter. Or as Marx uh, put it put poetically, money is the alienated ability of mankind, that which I am unable to do as a man, and of which therefore all my individual essential powers are incapable, I am able to do by the means of money. Money thus turns each of these powers into something which in itself it is not, turns it, in uh, that is, into its contrary. In early 2015, a historical accident made me Greece's finance minister. Given my mandate to clash with some of the most powerful people and institutions in the world, the international press peered in, into my articles, books, and lectures for clues of what, I would, uh, of what to expect. They were baffled by my claim to be a libertarian Marxist, a self-description that was immediately derided by several libertarians and most Marxists. When a, one of the Reuter in, interviewers asked after the source of my obvious confusion, I jokingly replied my parents. Joking aside, father was at least indirectly responsible for another crucial component of my political education, my inability to see how one could generally cherish freedom and tolerate capitalism, or vice versa, how one could be both illiberal, illiberal, okay, so like the opposite of a liberal, uh, and a left-wing, and left-wing, sorry. Between them, he and my feminist mother queethed uh, me a perspective diagonally opposed to what was become sadly conventionally fallacy that capitalism is about freedom, eff efficiency, and democracy, while socialism turns on justice, equal equality, and st uh, statism. Don't know why I was going to read Satanism, uh, statism. Uh, in fact, from the very start, the left was all about emancipation. During the feudal era, which became properly entrenched across Europe in the 50th century, econ economic life involved no economic choices. If you were born into the landed gen uh, gentry, it would never cross your mind to sell your ancestors' land. And if you were born a serf, you were compelled to toil the land on the landlord's behalf, free of any illusions that one day you might own land yourself. In short, neither land nor labor power was a commodity. They had no market price. The vast majority of the time ownership of them changed only through wars or conquest, royal decree, or as a result of some catastrophe. Then in the 18th century, something remarkable happened. Because of the, advance, the advances in shipping and navigation, international trade in tight like wool lined silk and uh, spices made them lucrative, thus giving British landlords an idea. Why not evict and um, uh, evict and masses the serfs from land and produce worthless turnips and replace them with sheep, uh, those like back produced precious wool for the international markets. The peasant's eviction, which was now Im uh, remembered as the enclosures, for it involved the fencing uh, them off from the land their ancestors had held for centuries, gave the majority of people something they had lost at the time they agriculture, uh, the agriculture uh, that agriculture was invented: choice. Landlords could choose to lease land for a price, reflecting the amount of wool it could produce. The evicted serfs could choose to offer their labor for wage. Of course, in reality, being free to choose was no different from being free to lose. Former serfs who refused squalid work for a pitiful wage starved to death. Profound aristocrats who refused to go along with the commodification of their land went bankrupt. As feudalism re receded, economic choices uh, arrived, ar arrived, but was as free as the one offered by a ma mafioso who... Sm uh, smilingly tells you, I shall make you an offer you cannot refuse. <laughs> By the middle of the 19th century, the thinking of Marx and other f uh, foundational left-wing thinkers was all about freeing us. 
Specifically in this era, it was about freeing us from a Dr. Frankenstein-like failure to control our creations, not least the machines of the Industrial Revolution. In the ageless words of the Communist Manifesto, a society that has conjured up a, such a giant means of production and of exchange is like the sorcerer who is no longer able to control the power of the netherworld whom he has called up by his spells. For over a century, the left was concerned primarily with the deliverance uh, from self-inflicted uh, unfreedom, which is why it was so fundamentally aligned with the anti-slavery slavery movement the, uh, the suffragette, suffragette uh, groups sheltering pre persecuted Jews in the 1930s and 40s, black liberation organizations in the 1950s and 60s, the first uh, gay and lesbian protesters in the streets of San Francisco, Sydney, and London in the 1970s. So how did we get to this situation today where libertarian Marxist sounds like a joke? The answer is that sometimes the, in the 20th century, the left traded freedom from other things. The East, uh, from Russia to China, Cambodia, and Vietnam, as uh, the quest for emancipation was swapped from a totalitarian egalitarianism. In the West, liberty was left to its enemy, abandoned in the exchange for an ill-defined notion of fairness. The moment people believed they had to choose between freedom and fairness, between an iniquitous uh, democracy and a miserable state-imposed egalitarianism, it was game over for the left. On Boxing Day in 1991, I was visiting Athens to spend a few days with my parents. As we chatted over dinner in front of that same red brick fireplace, the red flag was being lowered from, uh, above the Kremlin. Thanks to dad's communist past and mom's social demo democratic leanings, they shared a common mood. They knew that on the very night, history was marketing not just the demise of the Soviet Union, but also the end of social democratic dream of a mixed economy in which government provided pu uh, public goods while the private sector, private sector produced uh, plentiful go goodies to satisfy our whims. All in all, a civilized form of capitalism where inequality and exploitation were kept in check in the context of a political media, mediated sorry, um, truce between the owners of capital and those who had nothing to sell but their labor. C circumspect through not gloom, the three of us agreed we were witnessing a defeat made inevitable once our side had lost the conviction that capitalism was in iniquitous, sorry, because it was inefficient, that it was unjust because it was illiberal, that it was chaotic because it was irrational. Falling back to basics, I asked mom and dad what freedom meant to them. Mother replied, the ability to choose your partners and your projects. Father's reply was similar, time to read, to experiment and to write. Whatever your definition might be, your dear reader, being free to lose in a variety of soul-crushing ways can't be it. Almost everyone today takes the capitalism as fish takes the water, without even noticing it is there, treating it as, treating it as the inevitable, irreplaceable, natural ether we move through. As Frederick Jameson famously put it, people find it easier to imagine the end of the world than the end of capitalism. For my father's generation of leftists, there was a brief moment in the mid to late 1940s where the end of capitalism seemed only a matter of a few years, if not months away. But then one thing led to another and capitalism's demise shifted further and further into the future until after 1991, it disappeared beyond the horizon. Being of the generation who had believed that capitalism was transitory, that continued to contemplate capitalism's expiry even after he had concluded that he would not live to see it. Nevertheless, a decade or so after our fireside experiments, sorry, uh, with the dream of socialism in deep recession, and while I dived into the works of the political economists, father increasingly immersed himself into the study of ancient technology.
Every now and then, feeling he could guiltlessly leave to me the exploration of capitalism's mystery, while he relished in the unalloyed joys of arche what archaeometry, that, that's a mouthful, uh, he would uh, speculate how capitalism might one day end, and what would replace it. His wish was that it would not die with a bang, but because bangs had a tendency to call good people in awful numbers, that instead of socialist islands might spring up spontaneously in our vast capitalist uh, archipelago, and that they would expand gra gradually, eventually forming whole continents sorry, on which technologically advanced commons would prevail. In 1987, he sought my help to set up his first desktop computer, a glorified typewriter, he called it, but with an impressive on-screen editing facility. Imagine how many more volumes Mark's complete works would uh, consist of if the bearded one, uh, I love that, uh, the bearded one had owned one of these, he joked, the bearded one, so that's a good way to call Marx. Um, he joked. As if to prove the point, he used it over the years that followed to crunch out voluminous papers and books on the uh, interplay between the ancient Greeks' technology and literature. Six years on, in 1993, I arrived at Paleo Foliero Home. I still can't read the name after this entire chapter. Uh, with a clunky early modem to connect a uh, clunky early modem to connect his computer to the fle fledging, fledgling internet. This was a game changer, he said. Struggling to dial up a woefully slow Greek internet provider, he asked me to kill the killer question that ultimately inspired this book. Now that computers speak to each other, will this network become capitalism impossible to overthrow? Or might it finally reveal its uh, Achilles heel? Caught up in my own projects and, dr and dramas, I never got to run to answering father's question. When I finally decided I was an answer for him, dad was already 95 and finding it hard to follow my musings. And so here I am, a five years later, only a few weeks after his passing, composing my answer blatantly, but I hope not in vain. Now that's, that's kind of sad, but that is the end of the first chapter. Damn. All right, that was a fun experience. Now, of course, as I did with the last series, uh, at the end of the series, I'm going to dedicate an entire episode just on the book, you know, just kind of me doing a bit of a summary, but also um, kind of giving my own opinions. However, I do have to add something, uh, which is something that I earlier on said, which was kind of, quote unquote, annoying me, but not, not literally, uh, was, was that... Um, it talks about historical materialism and it talks about how a lot of the world has, is like, con, you know, is c consistent of like two contradictory things. And that is literally one of the things that I was studying before recording the last episode of the last series of the communist manifesto, where I went in, into looking into, uh, uh, dialectic materialism, historical materialism, and then here it's all there. So one side I'm kind of like, cause I'm like, bro, I could have just, I, I would have been learning about it here anyways, but the reality is that if I probably hadn't learned about dialectic materialism and historical materialism, I probably wouldn't have understood that first chapter as well as I did. So I'm glad at least I did that. But that was very nice. That really gave a interesting view into Giannis's mindset. I do think that him calling himself a libertarian Marxist is kind of a a uh, rudimentary thing to do because I get what he means, but it's like, to me at least, but that's my opinion, of course, being a Marxist already means that you're a libertarian in its actual true essence, not in a liberal way, but in like this idea of like having liberty and, and you know, an emancipation of, uh, of, you know, the oppressed classes rights and stuff like that. Um, so yeah, I, I guess I agree with him, uh, but I don't know, it feels kind of, sassy or is like trying to you know kind of slay and be like yeah i i have this fancy name and i can get why a lot of people probably were like this is dumb but i get his mean i do get what he means and i think that he did a good ex he did a great explanation on why he calls himself that and good to know that he actually is a marxist because i i kind of thought he was but like i hadn't heard him say it and now i've read it so i'm like all right there you go i got it <laughs> there you go i got i got the final 
uh, kind of check mark in my in my list of things to make sure that he was a Marxist, which of course is him, him himself saying that he is. Anyways, if you enjoyed that long ass episode, uh, make sure to check out our Patreon. As I said before, if you can support us on a Patreon, you can support us in other ways and check out our website in the comments below on how you can support us. And of course, to join our Discord, follow our social media platforms so that you are aware of our newest content. And of course, if you do support us on Patreon and join the Discord server, you have access to some special perks, like, of course, submitting questions to our podcast Q&A, uh, which we do on our weekly podcast, which you should check out too. With that being said, I'll see you all in the next episode. Goodbye, everybody.